Hey everyone, welcome to part three of our traffic signal principles series. This one is about saturation and capacity. So we're looking at the calculations that are required to ensure that there's enough space or time to handle the flow of vehicles on each lane of each approach. If you haven't seen the previous two um, episodes in this series, then I'll put the links down below. Um, it's probably worth seeing those first. Anyway, I'm Alistair and this is ITS Now. We will be looking at first principles for the way in which capacity and saturation calculations are carried out for a set of traffic signals. Design engineers would normally use a software tool such as Linsig to calculate these as part of a computer model of proposed facilities. These models offer an opportunity to modify the design iteratively by making changes to a range of different parameters to achieve the most efficient form of operation, whilst accounting for constraints such as spatial restrictions. However, it really is important to understand the underlying principles to ensure that these tools are used both effectively and correctly. Before a traffic signal installation is designed or changed, it is important to understand the nature of traffic flow at the site. A traffic survey is normally carried out to ascertain the number of vehicles flowing through the junction at different times of day. In addition, to understand where this traffic is going, the survey should be carried out to obtain an origin destination matrix or OD for short. This therefore allows the designer to fully understand how the traffic flow changes through the junction over the course of the day. The traffic survey will normally count the number of vehicles which make each movement through the junction in 15 minute increments. The data should also be classified by vehicle type, so such as cars and lorries. However, in order to take account of the traffic composition in the calculations required in the design process, it is normal to convert the classified count data into passenger car units. These are referred to as PCUs for short. These equate to a nominal 5.75 meter vehicle length. We therefore use these conversion factors on classified count data to convert to PCUs. So we can see here that vans, trucks and buses are multiplied to account for their larger sizes, whilst the smaller sizes of motorbikes and cycles are also accounted for within the overall traffic flow requirement. Traffic flow is normally expressed in PCUs per hour rather than vehicles per hour. To calculate the hourly traffic flow, we need to firstly resolve each count period. To do this, we need to aggregate the classified count data using this formula. Therefore, in this example, we have 120 cars, 22 vans, 12 HGVs, three buses, and two motorcycles, totaling 159 vehicles. But this results in 187.4 PCUs. So you can see there's quite a big difference between vehicles in that period and actual PCUs. Then, we need to add the results from the other three, presuming this was taken in 15 minute segments in this hour to get the results in PCUs per hour. However, it may not always be possible to obtain survey data. For example, if the work relates to a new road, in which case forecast flows will need to be used instead. Once we know the likely level of demand, we then need to understand the capacity of the proposed design to ensure that it can cope with the traffic expected to use it. 
We therefore need to establish what is known as the saturation flow for each approach lane. At the start of the green period, vehicles will take some time to start moving and to accelerate to normal speed. However, after a few seconds, the discharge rate of the traffic reaches an approximately constant rate, referred to as the saturation flow or sat flow for short. It is the, the it is the theoretical average number of PCUs which would flow through an individual lane in an hour if it were to receive a permanent green signal, although in reality the headway between vehicles would increase so that saturation would not be maintained. Saturation flow can be measured, estimated or calculated and we'll look at these options next. At existing junctions, the preferred method is to measure the sat flow. This is achieved by counting the number of PCUs which cross the stop line in a saturated period and the amount of time taken. To do this, ignore the first few seconds of green time to account for the starting lag in the waiting vehicles. Uh, count from approximately the fourth vehicle crossing the stop line. Then simultaneously count the number of vehicles across the stop line and the time and time the period as well until either the end of the green period or the point when approaching traffic is no longer saturated. Record both the PCUs and the time period and repeat this process to achieve a significant sample size, typically a minimum of 50 PCUs. Therefore, for this example, 60 PCUs in 122 seconds is actually equivalent to 1,770 PCUs per hour. Because of the similarity of many characteristics of lane geometry at different junctions, in some instances it is possible to estimate the sat flow value. A theoretical maximum of 2080, that's 2080 PCUs per hour, is used for a single unopposed, so that means no traffic attempting to turn across their path, for a single lane. It is commonly found that conservative sat flow values of 1900 PCUs per hour, with a reduction to 1800 PCUs per hour for turning movements, will produce achievable results. However, differences in junction geometry and driver behavior will have an impact on the actual value achieved. It is also possible to calculate the sat flow taking account of the lane geometry and use. So we said it was accepted that a maximum sat flow capability for an unopposed lane is 2080 PCUs per hour. So to calculate the sat flow for a specific approach lane, we also need to take account of features such as the type of lane, whether it's a near side or an offside lane, the approach gradient and width, along with the proportion of turning traffic and the radius of that turn. We'll do a couple of examples to show how this formula is used. The first is for an offside lane on a flat approach, the lane is 3.25 metres wide and there is no turning traffic. So the maximum flow capacity of 2080 PCUs per hour minus 140 multiplied by zero for an offside lane minus 42 multiplied by zero and zero to represent a flat approach plus 100 times 3.25 which is the lane width minus 3.25, then all of this over the turning traffic, which in this example is zero for both proportion of turning traffic and radius. This example therefore is the theoret theoretical maximum sat flow of 2080 PCUs per hour. Our second example is for a near side lane on a 2.5% uphill approach, 2.8 meters wide with no turning traffic. Here you will see that we have included one for a near side lane, one for an uphill approach with a 2.5% gradient and a lane width of 2.8 meters, 
again with no turning traffic just to keep this simple. This shows the reduction from 2080 PCUs per hour to 1790 PCUs per hour. So this really does show how the geometric uh, constraints and features of a lane has an impact on this. Looking back at the saturation flow profile, we can also see the effective green period. Because of driver reaction times, vehicle dynamics and driver attitudes to driving through the leaving amber period, this tends to be result in the end lag of vehicle discharge being longer than the starting lag. Therefore, the effect of green period is slightly longer than the actual green time. The formula for effective green is actual green, so there's big G, plus one second. And the example is 12 seconds actual green time, plus one second, giving an effective green, a small g, of 13 seconds. The next item we are going to look at is degree of saturation. This is the ratio of demand flow to the capacity of a lane as defined by the sat flow. The degree of saturation is a primary measure of how well a signalized junction will work, helping to identify any approach lanes which will require mitigating features to operate efficiently. Because of the fluid nature of traffic flow, account has to be made for the randomized arrival rate of vehicles during each cycle. To accommodate this, instead of assuming that the degree of saturation should not exceed 100%, a 10% margin should be applied to ensure efficient operation is achieved. Therefore, when designing a signal installation, it is preferable to restrict the degree of saturation to within 90%. To calculate degree of saturation, we multiply the demand with the cycle time over sat flow multiplied by the effective green. In an example, therefore, we have a demand of 450 PCU per hour and a cycle time of 90 seconds. The sat flow is 1,790 PCU per hour and the effective green is 26 seconds. This equates to an 87% degree of saturation, so below the 90% level. During the course of each cycle of the traffic signals, there is a proportion of time when vehicular traffic is not flowing. This is referred to as lost time. The lost time is made up of the interstage time moving between all the constituent stages in the cycle. However, as demonstrated under effective green, traffic will have a tendency to gain an extra second of effective green time at the end of each stage. This therefore needs to be taken account of when calculating lost time. In addition, periods where traffic phases are receiving an all red period, usually because of a pedestrian phase running, should also be counted as lost time. Our example for this is a three stage junction with five seconds into green from stage one to two, five second into green from stage two to three, 12 second into green from stage three to one, and a 10 seconds of all red period in pedestrian stage three, which equals 29 seconds lost time per cycle. The next set of parameters we're going to look at relate to capacity. These differ from the saturation parameters because they account for the way in which the proposed traffic signals will operate. Therefore, as incremental changes are made to the way in which the signals will operate during the design process, this will impact on the capacity parameters. The formula is therefore sat flow multiplied by effective green over cycle time. An example where sat flow equals 1790 PCUs per hour 
effective green is 26 seconds and the cycle time is 90 seconds equals a capacity of 517 PCUs per hour for that specific lane. As previously dis discussed under degree of saturation, we use a 90% maximum within the design parameters. So practical capacity incorporates this assumption. To calculate this, we therefore multiply capacity by 0 0.9. An example, using the same values we use for capacity, saturation flow equals 1,790 PCUs per hour. The effective green is 26 seconds and the cycle time is 90 seconds multiplied by 90, so we use a decimal 0 0.9, equals 465 PCUs per hour, a reduction of 52 PCUs per hour from the capacity figure. Please remember to click on the like and subscribe to keep updated on ITS now. A key metric used in determining capability to handle traffic flow is practical reserve capacity or PRC for short. This is derived from degree of saturation and accounts for the 90% saturation limit threshold. The formula used for PRC uses the saturation limit threshold expressed as a decimal minus the degree of saturation over the degree of saturation multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. The result for PRC should always be given as a percentage for a specific cycle time. An example, degree of saturation equals 87% and the cycle time is 90 seconds equals 3.45% PRC for a 90 second cycle time. The last element we are going to look at for capacity is how to calculate the Y values. There are two parts for this. The small Y provides an assessment for each stage and the large Y for the overall operation. The small Y values for individual stages are considered to identify critical elements within the cycle, which will provide an understanding of how the phase stage allocations will best work or if there is a critical capacity issue, which will need to be addressed prior to progressing the design further. The Y values should be calculated prior to starting a model so as to inform the basic design assumptions that will be used for staging arrangements. Capacity Y, so this is the small Y, is for an individual stage equals demand over sat flow. An example for this is a demand of 450 PCU per hour over a sat flow of 1,790 PCU per hour equals a Y of 0 0.25. We then use the small Y values to calculate the overall large Y value. So each stage small Y is added together and these are then added to the overall loss time over the cycle time and then finally multiplied by 100 to get a percentage. In this example, where Y for stage one equals 0 0.25, stage two equals 0 0.15, and stage three equals 0 0.25, and with a loss time of 29 seconds in a 90 second cycle time, equals a Y value of 97%. Although the result in this example provides a figure that is under 100%, the practical reserve capacity should be capped at no more than 90%. Therefore, this example should be reassessed to achieve a lower result. Figures higher than 90% indicate a lack of capacity of the proposed signals. The terms we have learnt in this episode are PCU, saturation flow, degree of saturation, loss time, effective green, capacity, practical capacity, practical reserve capacity, and the big and little Y values. 
A lot of numbers in this episode, but these steps are really essential to design an efficient traffic signal installation. As I said at the start, much of these are usually produced by the modelling package such as Linsig. But it really is essential that designers have an understanding of these elements from first principles, otherwise they may not achieve optimal results. To find out more about the areas we've covered in this episode and the rest of the series, make sure to have a look at my books Traffic Signals, which is an introduction to the subject, and Traffic Control, which goes into much more depth. Both of these are available from Amazon, or look on itsnow.org for more details and links. And lastly, could I ask you to subscribe to our channel? It really does help us to bring you further videos about ITS. Thank you to everyone who has subscribed. This is the last episode of ITS Now for this season, but don't worry, we're already working on season two. I'd like to thank everyone for their positive feedback and the companies we've been working with to bring you these episodes. If you'd like to be involved in an episode, please feel free to get in contact. We have some really exciting collaborations to bring you soon. Thanks for watching. See you next time.